Good evening. evening. Let's uh, open tonight's service with hymn number 127 from the hardback hymnal, number 127. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Let's all stand together. 127. Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 5, Revelation 5 for our scripture reading. Uh, The brethren in Spring Lake send their love and and covet your prayers, and I assured them that we were in prayer for them. Um, Rupert had a follow-up doctor's uh, visit Monday from his uh, recent cancer surgery, and it went well, so... uh, but uh, as the Lord enables you, pray for pray for them. They're in they're in a transition. Um, the, the older members that have been giving leadership to the church for many years now are dying off, and um, and the younger um, uh, men are going to have to bear the burden of responsibility, and um, it's just a, it's a transition. So. Um, but thank you for your prayers. We had had good services uh, Sunday. I was very encouraged, and I'm very thankful for the services you all had here. Um, uh, Robert, thank you, brother, and uh, you go. Um, who who will ever forget the stacking dolls? <laughs> That's a good. That was a good analogy. Yeah. Uh, and Trish and I were talking about it, and we were glad they weren't painted. <laughs> I've never seen stacking dolls that weren't painted. So, uh, but that was, that was good. <clears throat> All right, you have your Bibles open to Revelation chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. 
And we could understand this as the book of God's word. He holds the key of David. He has to unlock the mystery of the gospel to our hearts and open the book. And it's sealed with seven seals. The book of God's providence. The book of, uh, of the Lamb's book of life. Uh, with the names of those for whom the Lord Jesus Christ lived and died. All of these books uh, can only be opened by Christ. And if he doesn't open them, um, then there's no, there's no hope. No hope for anybody to be saved because there's no word and there's no, there's no covenant. Uh, the book has to be opened. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Oh, don't cry. Behold, <laughs> behold, <laughs> take notice, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. He hath gotten the victory. He hath finished the work. He hath redeemed his people. He hath satisfied the demands of the law. He hath prevailed, and he's able. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns, that's his power, and seven eyes, that's his omniscience, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth unto all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand, the him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders, that's the church, fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Let's pray together. Our merciful Heavenly Father, what great hope and comfort we receive in knowing that the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, hath prevailed, that he is seated at thy right hand, and that he is alive to make intercession for us, that he has seven horns and seven eyes, all power and all knowledge and all truth, to save thy people. Lord, we pray that you would enable us now by your spirit to set our affections on him. Lord, that you would cause us to put aside those things that would so easily beset us, those things that would distract us, those things that would cause us to, to look away from Christ and give us in this hour the grace and the mercy to look into the book and to see what the Lord Jesus Christ hath done to prevail. Well, we ask it in his name. Amen. Hymn number five in your gospel hymns. Stands to say. 
save you, full of pity, joined with power. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. Come ye needy, come and welcome God's free bounty. Every grace that brings us nigh Without money, without money Come to Jesus Christ and buy Without money, without money Come to Jesus Christ and buy let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to have a need of him. This he gives you, this he gives you, tis the Spirit's glimpse. Spirit's glimmering beam. Come ye weary, heavy laden, bruised and broken by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. Not the righteous, not the Righteous sinners, Jesus came to call. Not the righteous, not the righteous sinners, Jesus came to call. Please be seated. Somebody move those hymnals I put on that back table. Um, there was a couple stacks of the old paperback hymnals. Oh, they got thrown out. <laughs> oh, oh, I just put them there. I was, I was going to announce for everybody to take them home. So we'll put them back out. Take as many of those as you want. Um, now that we have the new ones, uh, if you want to take one home with you or two or three, feel free uh, to do that. Okay. Let's uh, open our Bibles to Micah chapter 6. Micah chapter 6. <clears throat> the Lord has given us in his word as clearly as it can be said what it is he requires of us. And I have read several commentaries of men who I, you know, I, I benefited from many of much of their writing. And, uh, and yet I've not read anybody that has properly understood what it is God requires of us. Um, Without exception, everyone that I've ever read takes me back to the law and uh, gives me something to do in order to make myself acceptable to God. If that's what this passage means, then I have not understood the gospel. I don't believe it is. And I believe that what it does mean will be of great comfort and encouragement to every child of God to understand 
what it is that God requires of me. Here it is. Verse 8 of Micah chapter 6. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Now, everybody I've ever read on this passage of Scripture tells me that to do justly means to do right. I want to do what's right. You want to do what's right all the time. You don't want to do wrong. You want to keep your promises. You want to fulfill your duty. You want to be honest in your dealings with men and with God. But if that's what doing justice is, if that's what God requires of me, I fall short. I fall short. The word justly is a legal term. The word justice means that the law has been fulfilled. That's what it means. You wouldn't have any patience with a judge that would uh, let a criminal off without satisfying the demands of the law. The law says that if you don't do justly, that these are the consequences to be paid. And in order for justice to be satisfied, those consequences have to be paid. And so it's a legal term. To do justly means to fulfill the law. To love mercy. To love mercy. Oh, I've read men that talk about being charitable and being generous and being gracious in your dealings with men. I want to be charitable. I was talking to a pastor this past week. Had a couple had been attending his church for years, listening to the gospel. And, uh, and they left and told him that the church wasn't charitable enough. <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't showing enough charity. They didn't, have any, they didn't have any programs going on to help you know, the poor and that sort of thing. Um, what is it to love mercy? Is, to, is it, as we are told by many, to uh, be tolerant and to show sympathy towards other men? Is that what it means to show mercy? What about walking humbly? This is what God, now here's the three things that God says I require of you. Do justice. Love mercy. And walk humbly with thy God. Now I love humility. I love when I see it in others. I hate it when it's veiled by my pride. I, I hate the, the absence of it in my own life. And it's so, it's so sweet and beautiful when, I, when you see it in the lives of others. I want to be humble. But what does it mean to walk humbly with thy God? Does it mean that we're to show humility and be gentle and modest and polite and respectful to one another? We want to do all those things. I read one commentator that said, no, it means to fulfill the duty of the first four commandments. That's what it means to walk humbly with thy God. To study, to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what it means to walk humbly. To be fervent and constant in prayer. That's what it means to walk humbly before your God. If I measure... My success in fulfilling what God requires of me by those definitions, I don't, I don't measure up. I fall short of the requirements. 
Solomon concludes all of Ecclesiastes with this. Here is the whole of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole, and you'll notice in the King James, the word duty is put in italics. It's not there in the scriptures. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. What does it mean to fear God and to keep his commandments? Well, I think that the, the, the meaning of that is exactly what the Lord's saying here. Let's begin. Man, man comes into this world believing that he's got to do something to recommend himself to God. He's just, he's just, that's his nature. That's his nature. He believes he's got to at least do his best in keeping the commandments of God. He's got to at least show some evidence of, of faith in order, to, in order to have any hope of salvation. Uh, he'll, he'll say that, oh, it's not by, it's not by works, it's by grace. And then he'll, and then he'll say, well, you know, you've got to, you've got to make a decision. You've got to, you've got to perform certain, uh, duties. Uh, you've got to keep God's commandments and make them your rule of life. And, and so they'll, they'll talk about grace and then they'll turn right around and make salvation a matter of works and we'll all do it. And even the children of God remain recovering Pharisees their whole life. Let me tell you what the evidence of that is. You remember in Matthew chapter 5 when the Lord said uh, to uh, agree with your adversary quickly lest he go to the law? Now, Satan is our adversary. He's the accuser of the brethren. What does Satan say to you and to me? Look how, now he doesn't say this to the unbeliever. To the unbeliever, he points them to their righteousness. He points them to their good works. He, he gives them comfort and false hope. Uh, by by saving their conscience with the hope that they've that they've done their best, but we know better, and he can't he can't get us that way. So what's he do? What's he do? He points out our sin, doesn't he? And he says, "Look how evil you are. Look how wicked you are. You see, it's self righteousness in reverse." God's going to judge you for that. You're going to go to hell because of, because of how wicked your sin is. <laughs> and the Lord said, agree with your adversary quickly, lest he take you to the law. <laughs> there is something that you can agree with the devil about. That's right, I said it. <laughs> I thought about making that statement a long time today before I made it, but I just made it. <laughs> There's something you can agree with the devil about when he tells you about the wickedness and the evil of your sin and your heart. You agree with your adversary quickly. And the quicker you agree with him, the more you'll know that the law has nothing to say against you. (laughs) <laughs> this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You're right. You're right, Satan. I'm a sinner. <laughs> and I'm a whole lot worse than I think I am. <laughs> I was talking to somebody recently and they were, uh, you know, they, they, they were going through all these therapies and, and, and counselors. And they, everybody was telling them, you know, the reason that you've got so many problems is because you just have a low self-esteem. You, you feel worse, worthless and you feel bad about yourself, and, and you just need to, you need to think better, and you'll be better. And I don't guess anybody's ever told him what I told him. But I told him, I said, I said you're a whole lot worse than you think you are. <laughs> you're a whole lot worse than you think you are. 
And it put him back on his heels. And it, but but he but he he heard something, and and um, I'm very hopeful that you know that the Lord's going to show him this. So when your adversary says to you, "Look how wicked you are," you agree with him quickly, and don't let him take you to the law. Now, if you try to justify your sin, or if you try to excuse it, or if you try to try to you know, make it less than it is, then he's going to drag you to the law and you're going to have no hope. And what the Lord say in Matthew chapter five, if he takes you to the law, the law is not going to be satisfied until it's full penalty is paid. The full penalty of the law is paid. So (laughs) just like the Lord uses our, old man to drive our new man to Christ, just like uh, uh, Esau serves Jacob. Uh, Satan is God's Satan. He's God's devil. And uh, if the Lord uses him to expose our wicked hearts, praise God. If we're, if we're, if we're brought as sinners to see our need for Christ and we, and we flee to him, For our righteousness and for our justice before God? Yes, I'm a sinner, but that's who Christ came to save. And and I'm running to him. (laughs) And I know that he satisfied the law. And you're not going to get get me to to believe that God's going to punish me for my sin. He's already punished Christ for my sin. I'm looking to him. So this, this thinking that what we do has anything at all to do with our salvation is in our, it's in our DNA. It's in our nature. It's, you know, it, it, it was with us from birth. Uh, and, and, and even as the children of God, we, we struggle with it, don't we? What must I do to be saved? Isn't that what the Philippian jailer asked? Now I want to know the answer to that question. What must I do to be saved? What does God require of me? Those Pharisees asked the Lord in John chapter 6 when they said, uh, What works can we work to do the works of God? And what did the Lord say? This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. Now, the Lord wasn't saying you want to do the work of God, then you just figure out a way to believe. No, this is the work of God <laughs> that you believe. If you believe, God has done a work of grace in your heart. He's caused you to flee to Christ. It's no wonder... That works religion is very profitable. Men are drawn to it. They will will make sacrifice. They will traverse land and sea to make one disciple twice the devil of themselves, won't they? We've done it. We've done it. They'll... They'll punish themselves. They'll give of their money. They'll, they'll do whatever they can do in order to try to save themselves. And if doing justly and loving mercy and walking humbly before our God has anything to do with something that we do, then uh, we're just back to works, aren't we? We're just back to works. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1. Verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Now the Lord's speaking to Israel (laughs) and he's calling them Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. 
To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? Unto me, saith the Lord, I am full of the burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. And when you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more empty oblations. That's all they are. Vain commitments. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity. Even your solemn meetings, your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear, for your hands are full of blood. Now, the Lord is describing their religious activity. He's not talking about the wicked stuff they're doing. He's talking about their religious meetings. He's talking about their prayers. He's talking about their sacrifices. He's talking about the things that they're bringing to the altar in hopes of winning the favor of God. This is what God requires of you, not those things. Quit the evil of those things. What God requires of you is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly, not before men, but before thy God. That's what God requires. To do justly. What is it to do justly? First thing I want you to notice is that that verb to do, you see it right there in your text? It's in the infinitive, which just simply means that it's a, it's a verbal noun. It would be better translated doing, I-N-G. Just put I-N-G at the end of it. Doing justly. In other words, you continue to do justly. That's what God requires of you. You're all, now, what is justly? What is justice? Justice is the satisfying of the law. And you can't do it. <laughs> no more than you can keep the commandments of God. You can't do it. So what is it to do justly? It's to look to the Lord Jesus Christ for all your justification before God. That's what it is. Turn me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted for him for righteousness. Know ye therefore... That they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And someone, matter of fact, I mentioned this last Wednesday night. The lady that cut my hair, I had a chance to talk to her. I guess it was, well, I ran into her today. Going to Sam. She was standing out front and, and uh, she told me, she said, I've been thinking about what you said the other day. I said, wow, thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, but uh, she was saying, you know, what? Well, doesn't God love all of his children? And I told her today, I didn't remember to tell her this the other day when I was talking to her, but I told her today, I said, you know, the Lord said to the Pharisees who believed that they were the children of God, that they were children of the devil. And uh, she said, oh, I hope that's not true of me. I said, well, come and listen. You know, come. Um, so, uh, those that are of faith are the children of Abraham, the children of God. There, no place in the Word of God does it call all men the children of God. The elect are the children of God. Those who believe God 
and have the righteousness of Christ imputed to their account. The only one who ever kept the law. The only one that ever did justly. The only one that ever satisfied the demands of God's law. That's what he did. He, he presented before God a righteousness that, that God required. And he, and, and he suffered for the sins of his people and, and put away the, 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 the judgment and wrath of God. And the scripture foreseeing that God would do justly the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. If doing justly means that I've got to keep the law, and that's what God requires of me, I'm in trouble. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. You want to keep the law, you're going to have to keep it perfect. The curse of God is upon anyone who does not keep the law of God perfectly. (laughs) And so when I fear God and keep his commandments, I'm looking to Christ. I'm resting in Christ. (laughs) And all the commandments of God are satisfied in the person of my Savior. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. (laughs) The Lord Jesus Christ suffered the full curse of God's wrath for my law breaking, for your law breaking. So justice is satisfied. And I do, I continue to do justice. (laughs) To whom coming, I am doing justly as God gives me faith to look to the Lord Jesus Christ and rest in him. That's what God requires. That's what God requires. Doing justly is taking sides with God against yourself. David said in Psalm 51, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thy might be justified. That's where our problem is. You see, we're... David had sinned against Bathsheba, he'd sinned against Uriah, he'd sinned against the children of Israel in what he did. But he said, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified. (laughs) Lord, you're you're the one that's got to be justified. I can apologize to to Uriah. I I can, you know, I I mean, uh, maybe not to Uriah. I can apologize to Bathsheba and to the people of Israel. I can confess my sins. But, Lord, for justice to be done, you've got to be reckoned with. And for that to happen, you're going to have to purge me of my sin. Doing... Justly reconcile with your adversary quickly. Don't let him take you to the law. (laughs) Agree with him. Yep, I'm a sinner. Oh, and it's a whole lot worse than I think it is. And it's a whole lot worse than you're making it out to be. But you're not going to take me to the law because the fact that I agree with you about the fact that I'm a sinner is the evidence that I have that I'm trusting the Lord Jesus Christ for my justification before God. 
Have you tried to make light of your sin or justify your sin or compare yourself to yourself or to other men or to the law and make it look like things aren't so bad like everybody else does? Then you're going to be under the curse of the law. Yep, I'm a sinner. To love mercy. (laughs) Oh, I need mercy. Lord, withhold from me what I deserve. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. John's father, Zacharias, when he's finally enabled to speak. In verse 67, and his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and hath redeemed his people. He's accomplished our redemption. (laughs) He he was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. He's the one that's full of grace and full of truth. He's the only one I need to be pleasing before God. I am accepted in the beloved. And that's the only way I'm going to be accepted. And what God requires of me is to look to Christ for all my justice all my justification to look to Christ for all my mercy. Look what Zacharias goes on to say and hath raised up a horn of salvation. Remember the seven horns we just read about in revelation. The horn is a picture of strength, power. That's the, that's the end of the animal. You don't want anything to do with you have dealing with animal with horns and that's, uh, he's got the horn of salvation. He's got the, it's the power of the gospel unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And he hath the horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. (laughs) Adam spoke of Christ. Abel spoke of Christ. The prophets of God have been speaking of him from the very beginning of time. That we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. Who's your enemy? Your old man's your enemy. Your sin's your enemy. Hell's your enemy. The law of God's your enemy. <laughs> in that if you're not found in Christ, it's going, to, it's going to destroy you. What did this one come to do? To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. That's what he came to perform. <laughs> Oh, there's my hope. I love, I love to be saved like that. I love mercy. I love mercy. I love the, the hope of knowing that the covenant of grace extends to me the mercy of God in the accomplished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's... He satisfied justice. He fulfilled all righteousness. And I get to love mercy. And walk humbly before thy God. Let me show you a verse of scripture I just discovered. It's in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter uh, 20. 23. Isaiah chapter 23. The Lord is talking about the destruction of the world in Isaiah chapter 23. And in verse 9, it says, The Lord of hosts hath purposed it to stain the pride of all glory. (laughs) Has he stained your pride? Has he? I mean, you're full of it. But you hate it, don't you? You hate it. And our pride's been stained. 
Because we, 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 want, we want to walk humbly before our God. And we do. We do. When we're in the presence of God, there's no pride. There's no pride. Now, Trish and I, we, we pray together occasionally for special needs or if we're going to have a meal or something to that effect. But somebody asked me recently, you know, well, don't you and your wife have prayer time together where you just get before God? I said, no. No, I don't. I don't want her to hear what I'm saying to God. She'd lose all confidence in me. And I don't want to hear what she's saying to God. Prayer is very personal. If he stained your pride and you're crying out to God, you're pouring out your soul to him. You're confessing your sin to him. You're begging him for his mercy and for his grace. You get in your closet and you do that all by yourself. And you will find yourself walking humbly before your God. Isn't that? Isn't that our experience? First Corinthians chapter one, and we'll conclude with this. Verse twenty seven But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Has he made you foolish? Oh, Lord, I'm such a fool. I'm so weak. I can't do justice. I can't be humble. I can't can't be merciful. I can't keep your law. I can't. Lord. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, the base things of the Lord of the world, and the things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, the things which are not. Is that you? (laughs) If you're a child of God, I know it's you. I know that's what you think about yourself. I'm just not. (laughs) I'm not able. (laughs) I'm not able to, to do anything to recommend myself to God. I'm completely dependent upon another to do it for me. To bring to naught the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence. We are the true circumcision which worship God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence. For of him, of God the Father, are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us all our wisdom, all our righteousness, all our sanctification, and all our redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now, let's go back to our text. I said that was the last passage, but I want to show you something in our text before we, before we leave Micah chapter 6. Verse 5, O my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, consulted and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Shittim unto Gilgal, that ye may know the righteousness of the Lord. So this passage of scripture in terms of what God requires of us. Now look what he says. Wherefore shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? (laughs) He hath shown thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee to do justly, to love mercy And to walk humbly with thy God. That's what he requires. You can offer your child on the altar. Burn up your kids. That's God saying you can't bring anything. 
But he says all of this is in the context of what God made Balaam say to Balak. Balak, the king of Moab, hired Balaam to pronounce a curse against Israel. And Balaam kept trying to to make good on that. And he kept trying to get Balak. But God forbid him. God put the words in Balaam's mouth. And rather than cursing the children of Israel, Balaam blessed the children of Israel. And here's what Balaam said at Shittim. Here's what he said. He hath not, Balaam speaking, Numbers chapter 23, God hath not beheld the iniquity of Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel, for the Lord his God is with him. (laughs) That was a false prophet who spoke the truth. God hath not beheld the iniquity of Jacob, neither hath he seen the perverseness of Israel. Now the Lord's saying, you want to know what I require of you? Look back at that prophecy that I put in the mouth of Balaam. Because that's where your righteousness is. I don't see your iniquity. If you're in Christ, you're doing justly. You are loving mercy and you are walking humbly with your God. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. Oh, how we pray that you would increase our faith. Cause us, Lord, to find in Christ all of our justice before thee. To love your mercy and to walk humbly, confessing our total dependence upon you. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's stand together, Brother Tom. Number 30 in the in the um, the small gospel hymns. Christ has 
sworn they shall not perish who believe on me their Lord.